All right, it's time to dig in. So we're going to take a look at atomic energy levels. What are the allowed energies in an atomic system? And in order to answer that question, first we have to ask ourselves, how is energy stored within an atom? So when we connect macroscopic thermodynamics to a molecular understanding, we need to understand that energy distribution on a microscopic scale. And if we think about atoms as the most fundamental particles, there are two ways to store energy in an atom. One is the electronic energy. So the electrons, which are distributed about a nucleus, will have associated with them kinetic energy, they're in motion, and potential energy. They're attracted to the positive nucleus, and they're repelled from one another. An atom will also, as a physical object, have translational energy. That is, as an atom moves through space, it has kinetic energy associated with its velocity and its mass. So that's kinetic energy only, unlike the electronic energy, which is potential as well as kinetic. One of the simplest systems, chemically, simplest system in the universe, I suppose, is the hydrogen atom. So the hydrogen atom is one electron surrounding one proton. It turns out that the Schrodinger equation that describes the motion of an electron about a proton can be solved exactly, analytically. And from that solution, we learn the following. There are quantized energy levels, one, two, three, four, up to an infinite number, actually. And in terms of terminology, we refer to the lowest allowed energy level as the ground state of a system. So a ground state hydrogen atom has an energy binding the electron to the proton of minus 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18th joules. The next allowed energy level up, n equal 2, has an energy of minus 5.44 times 10 to the minus 19th joules. And there's another level after that, number 3, and then number 4. And you'll notice that the spacing between these levels is getting closer and closer. So they're not equally spaced. And if we look at the physical properties of hydrogen atoms in these various energy levels, we discover that what, what is happening is that the electron is moving further and further away in terms of the average distance from the proton. And so for the ground state, remember that's the lowest quantum number. So n is called a quantum number. It is the integer that indexes what level, what of the allowed energy levels is occupied. The distance, the average distance, this is actually an expectation value is what we would call that in quantum mechanics. So uh, what is the most likely distance you would get after averaging over a large number of uh, experiments is 5.3 times 10 to the minus 11th meters. And so if you remember an angstrom is about 10 to the minus 10th meters, it's about a half an angstrom. This unit of distance actually defines the atomic unit of distance, which is called the bore. So one bore is defined by a hydrogen atom in its ground state. And as I raise the energy higher, 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 ultimately I get the electron to be infinitely separated from the proton. That is, there is no interaction between them. And we define that to be zero. There's no interaction, so the energy is zero. And that's why we see here at n equals infinity, that zero, that would be an ionized hydrogen atom. And relative to that zero, that allows us to assign this number to the ground state. Now, if you focus on these energy levels, you would note that they have a certain progression which can be well described by a, a simple equation. It says that the energy of a given allowed level indexed by its quantum number is equal to some constant divided by the square of the quantum number. Right? So if n is 1, then n squared is 1, and we would get the ground state energy, which sure enough, it's right here. It just isn't expanded to as many digits, so rounded to 2.18. We can also uh, convert joules to a different unit of energy. Here's the wave number. So if you prefer reciprocal centimeters, it's 109,680 divided by n squared reciprocal centimeters. So this simple formula to compute the energy levels would also let us compute the difference in energy between different levels and the energy required to ionize the hydrogen atom by letting n go to infinity, at which point uh, energy is zero. 
So uh, I'll let you take a moment here to actually do a little self-assessment, making use of this equation, and then we'll come back to continue to look at atomic energy levels. Most of you will certainly have seen uh, this analysis of hydrogen before, and probably the way you've seen it is in the context of hydrogenic orbitals. So what are the wave functions associated with these allowed energy levels? Well, the ground state energy level, there is one wave function with that energy, and we usually call that the 1s orbital. So the next level up, n equals 2, has four different wave functions, all of which have the same energy. That's called degeneracy. So when there are multiple solutions to the Schrodinger equation, all with a common energy, we say that those solutions are degenerate. So given that there are four possible solutions, the degeneracy is four. And we often index degeneracy by g, and again, a subscript to say which level. If we go up to the third allowed energy level, or the third quantum level, sometimes we would say, now it turns out that there are nine orbitals or wave functions that satisfy the Schrodinger equation that all have that energy. So the degeneracy is now nine. And looking at these orbitals, of course, you recognize here's the classic 1s. Here's a 2s. It has a node somewhere in it, but we're drawing it solid so we can't see it. And here are the 2p orbitals. Here's a 3s, two nodes hidden in there somewhere. Here are the 2p's, and for some of them, this one, for instance, you can actually see the nodal structure, and here you see it as well for the 3p orbitals. And these are the 3d orbitals. There are five of those. And these are the classic atomic orbitals, more carefully hydrogenic orbitals that one is presented with very early in the study of chemistry. Now, some of you may be experiencing a moment of cognitive dissonance, perhaps, because you've seen these orbitals arranged in energy ordering before, and someone has told you that the 2s is lower in energy than the 2p's, or the 3s is lower than the 3p's is lower than the 3d's. That's actually not true. It's not true for this system. As I've shown it, these degeneracies are correct. All nine of the solutions for the third quantum level, the 3s, the 3p, the 3d, they all have the same energy in a one electron atom. Normally, we don't work with just one electron. It's not just hydrogen in an excited state. It is a more complicated atom. Turns out once you add additional electrons to the system, that changes the energies of S and P and D solutions. So everything you've been taught hasn't been a lie, but at least for the hydrogenic system, the degeneracy as shown here is what it is. And you've probably noticed it looks like it's n squared, right? For n equal 1, the degeneracy is 1. For n equal 2, it's 4. 3 goes to 9. And sure enough, that's correct. The degeneracy of hydrogenic solutions is n squared, where n indexes the quantum level. So what do we do with many electron atoms? Well, it turns out there's no simple formula for the electronic energy of such atoms. We can either do electronic structure calculations with a big digital computer, or, you know, atoms have been around a long time, and they've been studied pretty carefully. So you can look up in tabulated data what are energy levels. So here's an example drawn from so-called Moore's tables, which are these big tables of atomic energy levels that are available. And it's for the sodium atom. And it's just showing you for a variety of different states, different ways to organize the electrons around the atom, what's the degeneracy and what's the allowed energy associated with that state. And if you look here, you see that the ground state, which will be used to define zero here, you have to go up 16,956. It's very precise, 0.183 wave numbers to the first excited state. If you were to work out, I, I won't make you do a self-assessment, but if you were to work out what wavelength of light that is, you would discover it's sort of roughly yellowish. And that's why sodium lighting on highways, for instance, uh, or in cities, often has kind of a yellowish tinge to it. That's sodium vapor that's been heated hot enough that it emits light from its first excited state down to its ground state, and uh, the color of that light is dictated by the allowed energy level. All right. Happily, for most of the thermodynamics that we will be working on, we will not be at temperatures that are hot enough that these kinds of states are accessed very often. That will matter when we compute partition functions, which we'll be doing in uh, not so long. But for now, we'll just recognize that complicated atoms or molecules, we may have to just look up things. 
translational energy. So that's the other energy available to an atom. It's moving through space. It has kinetic energy. So how do we go about computing that? We construct a Schrodinger equation. And the equation it has to do with a particle of mass m constrained in a box having variable side lengths. So in one dimension, then, you would have a little particle here. And it can move left or right. And the box, it's only one dimension, but we'll think of a one-dimensional box, you're allowed to be anywhere from, say, 0 to a, where a is the length. The particle can be anywhere in there, and it can't be outside there. And if you solve the relevant Schrodinger equation, you will discover that the allowed energy levels, so indexed by a quantum number, and the number goes 1, 2, 3, dot, 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 the degeneracy of every level is 1, so every state is unique in its energy. It goes as n squared. Here's Planck's constant again, h squared, divided by 8 times the mass times the square of the length of the box. So given that you would know those parameters ahead of time, the mass, the length of the box, poof, you have all the allowed energy levels. If we go to three dimensions, it's a little bit more complicated. Obviously, our box can be a little more complicated. I've got a little particle here. It's bouncing around. A for one length, B for another length, C for another length. I've drawn what looks like a cube, but they don't have to all be equal. And when you do the solution, you find that it has roughly the same structure. There's still this h squared over 8m that you find here, h squared over 8m, where m is the mass. But now every dimension, x, y, and z, has its own quantum number associated with it. Still depends on the square. Still depends on the square of the links of the sides. But notice that states can be degenerate. That is, for instance, let's say that a and c just happen to be the same length. Well, in that case, quantum numbers indexing a state, I could talk about state 1, 1, 2, which is just the list of the x, y, and z quantum numbers. If I consider a different state, 2, 1, 1, since a and c are the same value, doesn't matter whether I take 2 squared here and 1 squared here or vice versa, I'll get the same total energy. And so the degeneracy will just depend on the side lengths and the quantum numbers. It's hard to predict until you're given all of the data. So let's pause for a second, and I'll let you play with those equations in a, a short self-assessment. And you can make sure that you've grasped that concept of the quantum numbers in the particle in a box. All right, we've completed our examination of the available energy levels for an atomic system. Next, we're going to move on to consider molecules. And we'll consider the simplest molecule beyond an atom. You really shouldn't call an atom a molecule. But two atoms can be a molecule. So we will look at diatomics and the allowed energy levels in diatomic molecules. Before we move on to that lecture, though, let's take a look at one more demonstration to illustrate some of the key principles of quantum mechanics, and in particular, wave-like behavior. In a prior demonstration, we saw that electronic energy levels in atoms are quantized. And I pointed out how unusual that seems compared to the continuum of energies that can be accessed by, say, throwing a rock. However, we are all familiar with quantized phenomena at the macroscopic level, although we don't necessarily think of them that way. For instance, an organ pipe of a given size can only emit certain tones when air vibrates within it. If you want a different tone, you have to make a pipe of a different size. In this apparatus, I have a motor that is going to drive this large string in such a way to generate a wave. The other end of my string is fixed, so that it must always be in the same position. A mathematician or a physicist might call this a boundary condition. That is, a condition that must be satisfied at the edge of a system. Such boundary conditions can often lead to quantized phenomena and are present in many ways at the microscopic level. But here, we'll see an illustration at the macroscopic level. So when I turn the motor on, I can adjust the speed. And notice that the motion of the string is rather chaotic. Until I hit one certain point, I generate a so-called standing wave. The system is seemingly indefinitely stable in its behavior. Now, if I turn the speed up more, the motion again becomes chaotic until a certain rate of speed
at which I hit a new standing wave. See how this one has one position in the center where the band neither goes up nor down. That is called a node, and we can call this new wave an overtone, or a first harmonic of the original wave that had no nodes. In general, in wave mechanics, the more nodes, the more energy. If we turn the speed up still higher, we may be able to hit the second overtone. And there it is. See how it has two nodes? With a powerful enough motor, we could continue to access higher and higher overtones. But for now, let's just take this as another example of a quantized phenomenon and note that in atoms and molecules, such phenomena will ultimately play an important role in how they store and distribute energy.